The origin of this film lies in the work of a seminar of the Studiorum Novi Testamenti Societas, where the focus was on aspects of orality, New Testament interpretation, and Bible translation. One colleague and myself, and this colleague is Gosnell York, uh, he and I were, happened to be members of the uh, SNTS uh, scholarly organization. He had the chance to speak with uh, Professor Jimmy Dunn, who had been working in the area of orality as uh, a very important element in understanding the way in which the Gospels came to be. Jimmy began to be interested in what Gosnell brought to that discussion, which was uh, a background in Bible translation. And not just in translating ancient texts, but in translating uh, the Bible and in translators who were working in cultures and contexts in which orality was still a very vital part of community life and social life. And the three of us then began to hatch plans for a um, study group in the SNTS context which would take an interdisciplinary approach, which would look at New Testament studies, which would look at orality as it is currently being uh, studied and conceived of, with, again, the implications for Bible translation as one at least of the outcomes that we, we hope to achieve. The SNTS seminar had a three-year run, which is typical of an academic society, and it concluded its work in 2008. The research contributions moved in three directions. In the first place, the staggering implications of orality for New Testament studies were highlighted. Orality holds challenges for New Testament studies which goes to the core of the enterprise and which necessitates a thorough rethink of what the study of the New Testament actually is. These implications are so fundamental that it seems to imply a paradigm shift in New Testament studies. In the second place, the work of the seminar revealed that the emerging discipline of performance criticism should be part and parcel of any New Testament study. In the third place, the study of oral culture and the oral nature of the New Testament, plus the fact that the New Testament, to this day, more often than not functions in an oral, or mainly oral context, has huge implications for Bible translation. This is now only beginning to emerge. I do think we have been able to raise the level of awareness, uh, both for New Testament studies and translation studies, of the importance of orality as an element in social discourse, in social identity that is still uh, very much a part of modern cultures, but also very much part of that ancient culture in which the New Testament came to be. After the conclusion of the seminar, the idea of a documentary film as a novel way of communicating research results to New Testament scholars and senior students was explored. What follows is a film based on the work of the SNTS seminar from 2005 to 2008. When the first printed Bible was lifted off the Gutenberg printing press, it was one of the monumental achievements of humankind. But, ironically, it was also one of the most disastrous moments in the history of the study of that same Bible. Human culture changed irrevocably with the advent of movable type. It took a few hundred years to fully take effect, of course, but from that moment onwards, things were never the same again. Human culture had moved from an oral-based to a text and print-based culture. It changed everything. It changed the way in which people communicated, the way people entered into contracts, the way they exerted power, told stories and preserved traditions. Something was deemed reliable only if it was written down. Print culture began to dominate all forms of scholarly activity as well and science and technology moved forward by means of written texts. And into this culture, where written texts and books dominated, modern critical biblical scholarship was born. In a paradigm based on the fact that traditions and information originated and were transmitted in written form, biblical scholars found their arsenal of tools to explore and examine and interpret the Bible.
the Bible which they received on printed pages. Inevitably, these scholars viewed the Bible and the New Testament primarily as a text and consequently used tools designed for literary analyses to study it and to pose problems. Inconsistencies and strange agreements in the text were viewed as literary problems and the solutions offered were solely based on literary considerations. But these methodologies were flawed right from the start. The Bible they were studying didn't originate in a print culture. It originated in antiquity in a thoroughly oral culture where written texts were secondary and in service of an oral tradition. But biblical scholars did not keep this in mind. And so the theories and hypotheses regarding the Bible which were based on their location within a print culture were not appropriate to explore texts which originated in an oral culture where totally different dynamics were at play. Thus, for the last 200 years, biblical scholars have actually been studying the Bible from a flawed perspective, says Professor Werner Kalber of Rice University in Texas. I think one of the basic problems that is beginning to emerge about the historical critical analysis of the Bible is that it has assumed that the print page operates exactly the same like the manuscript page, and it doesn't. And so a number of our methodologies that we have used for over 200 years in biblical studies, a number of assumptions about gospel relationships, about pentateuchal relationships or sources, uh, increasingly look suspect. So. I think the, the most important thing for scholarship is that orality, scribality, scholarship challenges basic assumptions of historical critical scholarship. And I have the highest opinion of historical critical scholarship. But it has its blind spots. And those blind spots are deep. And I am of the opinion that orality scribality studies is not just a footnote to historical critical studies. It's not just an embellishment. It's not just something we add to it and then we can go on like we always did. I think it's much more far-reaching. It goes to the core of the way we look at manuscripts and about theories that we have developed about oral tradition and gospel narratives, for example. In fact, the results of virality studies in recent years seem to fundamentally challenge the very being of historical critical scholarship as it has been developed over the last two centuries. Professor Jimmy Dunn of Durham, England, is a New Testament scholar who also has been urging other biblical scholars to take the oral nature of biblical texts seriously. Orality studies, if, if you want to use that term, would be trying to understand how an oral culture works. And that's a very difficult question for us in the West, who've had uh, several centuries of a print culture, where everything uh, is written down, and that's the only way we know information, really, reliable information, we only know information to be reliable because it's written. In the arena of biblical studies, it has become clear that modern scholars living in a print-based culture deal with the New Testament texts anachronistically. They treat the ancient texts which originated in an oral culture in the same way as they would treat modern printed literature. When you're dealing with the material at a literary perspective, then the natural tendency is to think of an original edition, an original version of the material, which is then copied and edited and so on. And you get, uh, sometimes told, layers of tradition. And you can technically peel away the later layers because you say this later layer was told in a more Roman context, so all Roman uh, reflections in this, we'll just strip that away and that'll leave us with a lower level. It is this search for a single original text of the Gospels that has dominated almost all aspects of New Testament studies like textual criticism, Formgeschichte and even historical Jesus studies. The idea that a single original can be found or reconstructed 
stems from presuppositions born in literary culture. This is not a premise that is valid in a context of an oral culture. The search for an original document or version of a text is a distinctly print culture thing. The culture of the first century Mediterranean world was a thoroughly oral culture. But with oral tradition it doesn't work like that because uh, the oral uh, tradition experts keep saying to us uh, in oral culture there is no original. There is simply the variety of ways of telling this story or, or this teaching. So I think we've got to avoid um, thinking in terms of getting back to an original which alone is authentic as though everything which is uh, diverging from that is less authentic. The followers of Jesus would, the great majority of them, would have been illiterate. There would be the one or two who could. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, was probably literate. That's not to say that the culture was mm, not literary in another sense, because the culture of Palestine, Israel-Palestine at that time, uh, was heavily um, dominated, is perhaps too strong a word, by knowledge of the Torah, the written scriptures of Israel. Uh, but again, that's not to say that people could read these scriptures, uh, let alone that they had scriptures, as it were, on their own shelves. They would know scriptures because they would hear it read to them and expanded to them uh, in the, the weekly Sabbath gatherings. Dr. Gosnell York, a translation expert, also agrees that most ancients were not literate. No more than 10% of the elites were able to write and read. And so the vast majority would have been dependent on those who were able to write and read, who were able to speak, who were able to write what was written, and then capture that message through the medium of the ear. And not only the ear, but also, as I'm doing here, as you can already see, in terms of, should I say, body movements. Uh, for not only is the, the, the use of the voice... Uh, important in communicating a message, but one's whole body language, one, the whole gesture clusters. And so that's where we talk about uh, oral performance. And the writings that we now have in the New Testament weren't written down anyhow until at least 20 years after the death of Jesus, and most of them weren't written until 40 or 60 years after the death of Jesus. So we have a situation where all the early Christians would have heard them. And what we have in the New Testament are really sort of like transcriptions of performances or for performances. So, um, for example, uh, we think maybe the Gospel of Mark was really composed orally and was repeated any number of times and at some point in the history of its oral life was written down. Now, that didn't automatically freeze it in terms of the performances in the ancient world. They continued to be fluid. It is thus clear that oral traditions and even texts emanating from oral traditions function totally differently from the way modern biblical scholarship has assumed. Modern scholars see texts as the main carriers of tradition, but in ancient cultures, texts were not the main thing and had a very different function according to Professor David Carr. He has written extensively on this in his book, Writing of the Tablet of the Heart. And in that book, I explored what I call the cognitive technology of how texts were created over time in the ancient world. And the reason I'm focusing on cognitive technology is because the texts that I'm interested in, which are what I call long duration texts like Homer, Gilgamesh, or the Bible, um, were transmitted, I argue, within the context of ancient education. They were memorized within that context using the support of various written copies. So the written copies were really not the primary focus of the education. Instead, they served this process of internalizing the text. In his work on Hebrew written texts, David has found that written texts were in service of the memorization of oral traditions and not the end of a process as scholars have believed for so long. The main focus remained the oral tradition. He also found interesting evidence for this in Hebrew parallel texts.
here we can see a certain kinds of variants between these manuscripts, which are the kinds of switches that one sees in texts that are memorized. That is, places where words of the same meaning are exchanged, or places where lines are shifted in order, or word order is shifted, in ways that if you were copying a scroll visually, you would never make that mistake. But if you're recalling a text in your mind, you would, could easily make the mistake, because for you, the differences are virtually the same. What we find when we study parallel versions of prophecies in the Hebrew Bible, or parallel proverbs, or parallel historical accounts, is that the number of memory variants, what I call memory variants, where these kinds of things are switched, are far more common than the kinds of variants that would be typical of visual copying. And for me, this points to this process of internalization of a text um, within the ancient Israelite culture. David finds the same trends in New Testament texts. In the past, scholars viewed the texts from a perspective of a print culture and could only conclude that parallel texts pointed to written sources and this generated hypotheses like that of Q and the primacy of Mark. Viewed from a context of an oral culture, there are other and even more plausible explanations. There are also other trends visible in parallel texts which tend to point to an oral rather than a literary context. Such as the trend toward expansion of the memorized tradition, that is, if you really care about the tradition and have memorized it, you don't leave things out, but instead add things to it. And also the trend toward harmonization, where you take a tradition that you've memorized and you add things to it so that different parts of it agree better with each other than they did before. And I call that a form of hyper-memorization of the tradition. Even as you change the tradition, you're trying to be truer to it than it was to itself before. I believe that, um, that these kinds of dynamics point to the fact that this written culture is intensely focused on memorization. And this, I think, helps separate this focus on memorization from the oral. That many people, when they talk about oral culture, make that equivalent to memorization. I'm arguing that ancient written culture was also intensely focused on memorization. And so these written texts were in service of this process of memorization and reproduction and oral recitation of the classic tradition. Even verbatim agreements in traditions do not necessarily point to a literary context. One thing that psychological studies and anthropological studies of memory have shown is that for traditions that are, are transmitted virtually verbatim, that is where you see extensive verbal parallels, maybe with some of the kinds of switches that I'm discussing, but extensive verbal parallels, those kinds of traditions generally were transmitted through the help of writing. So I believe that writing plays an important role there. On the other hand, when we look at the New Testament text, textual tradition, the earliest manuscripts, or when we look at variations between, say, versions of a saying in Matthew and versions of a saying in Luke, we see the same kinds of memory variants that I was discussing in the Hebrew Bible, which points, I think, to the fact that these texts, although they were important, were servants to a broader process of memorization and recitation. They weren't the primary focus, and they weren't generally at that stage being copied um, visually. In such a context of a mainly oral tradition, the question of accuracy and reliability is viewed totally different from the way it is perceived of in a print culture. One of the things that I found most um, powerful in my early studies and trying to convey uh, in my teaching was the experience of reading the first three Gospels in particular in parallel columns, what we call a synopsis, uh, because they're all pretty well covering the same material, um, again against the same story, again against the same teaching, sometimes block of teaching. And yet when you look at it carefully, you see it's, it's different. The different emphasis, the different wording. It, it, again and again, you have the situation where it's, it's clearly the same teaching, clearly the same story, but there's hardly any word the same. The fluidity present in both oral and early manuscript traditions 
raises the question of the reliability of the transmission. This is a very controversial issue. To what extent accuracy was maintained? Were they performed or recited exactly in the same fashion? And I think the, that very question already is is formulated from modern print perceptions, because one of the hallmarks of print culture is that every copy is exactly like the other one. That was not true in manuscript culture, and it is not true in, let's say, the oral or the performance culture that interacted very closely with manuscript culture. But I don't think people were much preoccupied with this, whether it's ac accurately exactly the same. In fact, not only were they not preoccupied with it, I believe they couldn't even measure accuracy in the sense that we determine accuracy in our print culture. Uh, it was performed, it was reperformed, and uh, perhaps what we might call variants, variant versions, are a standard feature of orality or oral scribal cultures. And like the oral tradition, the early manuscript and scribal tradition was also extremely flexible. That would suggest that here we have continuity in terms of variability as you move from the oral to the written. That is to say, it doesn't seem to be the case at a very early stage that the scribal medium functioned to stabilize the variability of the oral tradition. So there is continuity in terms of variability. And this variation and flexibility so prevalent in oral cultures is also evident in the New Testament material. It brought a lot of discomfort to biblical interpreters who were steeped in a print culture where everything was fixed. They were looking for an original text. Hence, they only framed their questions and answers from a literary and print perspective. But these questions and answers were incompatible with what we now know of oral cultures. <laughs> only recently have New Testament scholars begun to take the results of orality studies seriously. With this, the disturbing realization has come that many of the observations, hypotheses and conclusions reached in the research so far have actually been based on faulty presuppositions. Serious doubts are now being raised with regards to accepted New Testament fields of study such as Formgeschichte, textual criticism, Q studies and historical Jesus studies. I do not want to give the impression that I am um, criticizing the great achievements of historical critical studies. We all have been most modern uh, scholars have been trained in historical critical studies. Its accomplishments are eminent. In fact, Western modernity is one of the hallmarks of Western modernity is the historical critical study of the Bible that defines us in fundamental cultural ways. That I, I, I do want to make this point very, very clear. But as far as the minute understanding ex of, of biblical texts in excessive detail is concerned, that is a preoccupation, once again, of a type of scholarship which is totally literary, which operates with print documents and c has lost touch with the oral documents dimensions of our biblical manuscripts. Quite obviously, when a gospel is proclaimed to the people, that's a very different experience on the part of the people than a scholar trying to find, to figure out the meaning of excessive details in the biblical text. And the recovery of that uh, oral dimension, I think, would be a beneficial experience for uh, modern biblical uh, uh, scholarship.
and the importance of orality studies has also become apparent in the study of other cultures and religious documents and texts, such as Islam, Judaism, and so on. In 2008, a conference was held at Rice University in Texas, where aspects of orality and its importance for religious texts and religious traditions were discussed. Orality studies have become a non-negotiable aspect of the study of ancient religious texts. Not only is orality studies forcing scholars to rethink what they've been doing all along, but if taken seriously, it is also demanding that scholars look at other methodologies and interdisciplinary studies which have a bearing on the study of an oral culture and the material produced in such a culture. In this regard, it seems that performance criticism has become the sine qua non for New Testament studies. In an oral culture, texts were not merely read aloud, there was an element of performance to it as well. Paul, an apostle, not from humans nor through a human, but from Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the assemblies of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for our sins in order that he might snatch us out of this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am shocked that you are so quickly deserting him who called you through the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who disturb you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to that which we proclaimed, let that person be cursed. Performance criticism is a fresh way of looking at the biblical text. Um, it isn't new in and of itself in that it incorporates several other disciplines. Um, historical criticism, uh, narrative criticism, um, orality criticism. And um, it really is eclectic in trying to gather together the, the research that has been done, but now almost in a paradigm shift looking at it as uh, bringing all these factors together with oral performance and not only how uh, a text might be changed in a literary fashion but how it how it sounds differently um, how it sounds and not only the sound of it but um, the interaction of a performer with an audience and in realizing that it's not just a performer that is uh, deciding the text, but that the audience becomes part of the performance as well and affects the performance. Um, thinking about oral performance in that way and how first century performances were done when we think of New Testament compositions, how the audience shaped these presentations. And a man with a um, shriveled hand was there. And uh, how these performers were using proximity to the audience, how they were um, responding to the audience's interaction. Um, and what we have, I think, with the New Testament compositions then is a frozen uh, performance, frozen in, in text form. But there are probably a variety of these performances done when I think of the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we have just one of those varieties uh, done with the New, Compos uh, New Testament composition. Take the letters of Paul. He composed them orally and then dictated them with the knowledge that they would have then be carried, probably memorized, probably Paul would have given directions about how to perform them. And then when the person who carried, the emissary who carried the letter arrived, he or she would likely have then performed the letter orally with instructions for Paul about how to do it. So what we have in the writings of the New Testament are sort of by comparison like a fossil of a living creature. The writing is like a trace 
of what was a live performance. If it was important for Paul to instruct his messenger to, on how to deliver this letter, how to perform it, um, then uh, it's true also of the gospel writers in, in, in uh, a degree anyway. There are you know, one or two clues in the gospels about uh, how this should be, should be done. Mark adds a little note, let the, the reader uh, take note here. Um, at one point, and, and this is to the reader. It's not not because he's writing to an audience who are all going to individually read it. It's it's the reader of the gospel uh, who's 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 he's writing to. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Anointed One, the Son of God, was just like it's written in Isaiah the prophet. Look. I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will pave your way. Voice of one shouting in the desert, pave the way for the Lord, make his paths level. It is perfectly well understood that yes, of course, they were recited in early Christian worship. And of course, early Christian worship, they spent many more hours in worship than we do. So there would have been time for the performance of the Gospels. Guy. Those early Christian worship services were profoundly oral, that uh, scriptures were recited either in part or whole, and then uh, homiletical interpretations or preaching on it, uh, I, I think it would be very difficult to discover. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. I went off to Arabia. Then again, I returned to Damascus. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. I stayed with him for 15 days, and I saw none of the other apostles except only James, the brother of the Lord. What I've written to you, behold, before God, I am not lying. Oral performances, as they have been done and are being done by David Rhodes and other people, um, I, I would warmly recommend to uh, our people to listen to it. I do think it's very true that you hear things in listening to a performance that have escaped you in reading. The performing of a text it's, it's amazing what it's capable of bringing out in the text. It restores the emotional dimensions of the text, just to begin with. Because uh, the, these are highly emotional stories that are designed to convey uh, uh, episodes Jesus about people who were transformed or healed or freed from something or hear good news or and and they're meant to have the same impact on the audience so when you tell the stories even in church in this way I've had times when I've been just telling the gospel lesson in church and I'm having trouble choking back my emotions because I'm so moved by Jesus healing the woman or, or saying forgiveness to the woman who was washing his feet with her hair. Also, it's able to bring out uh, humor. In fact, we think the ancient audiences probably laughed and cheered. I can imagine when Jesus confronts the authorities. I mean, here you have a totally peasant crowd in the Gospel of Mark. And here, come Jesus, here comes a story with Jesus. The authorities are trying to get him. And he's very clever in what he says. And in the end, he says some line that says what he wants to say and just cuts right through the opponents. And you can just imagine the cheers and the applause or whatever would be among the peasants to see Jesus in that kind of interaction. Performance criticism is not aimed only at an oral rendering of the text, but it explores many other facets as well. well I think that's important that performance criticism does not just hold these texts at, a, at arm's length or a distance, but in fact the argument is that you have to experience 
performance by actually doing performance as well, that new things are, are discovered in the performance. For me, I began experimenting with New Testament composition performance with the Book of Philemon. I decided to do it in Greek and uh, memorized it and then began performing this to uh, see how it was structured together. And what I found was that the sounds of this uh, composition were things that helped me remember. So there were mnemonic aids. Um, and it, it uh, was not just within my mind hearing these sounds, but as I was performing over in a variety of contexts, I could hear the rhythms or certain plays on sounds or words. And so it's in the performance itself that it becomes a, a tool of research. So it was really in the performance that, that I was able to uh, discover the value of this performance criticism, not just studying about performance, but actually doing it. By looking at New Testament texts from a performance perspective also reveals why scholars who study texts from a literary perspective have such a hard time agreeing. For example, in the introduction studies, there is amazingly little agreement among scholars as to the structure of a book. This is because they look for literary structures that do not exist. The texts are structured for performance, and it is here scholars ought to look for structure. It has not been done so far. The outlines that are given for New Testament compositions, in my opinion, are, are from the perspective of the author or the, the composer. Um, what I found in performing these passages was that there was also from the perspective of the audience. What would it take to, to bring the audience from uh, point A to point B in the rhetoric? Uh, and um, and sometimes these were logical uh, steps along the way, but more often, especially as I think of the Gospel of Mark, it was emotive. What would help move the audience along emotionally to understand this Jesus and understand how this Jesus interacted with, uh, whether it be Pharisees or, uh, or fishermen? And um, so the perspective of, of outline is really that of the author, whereas I think when we perform it, we get the perspective of the audience that is highlighted. And it is clear that performance criticism is set to become part and parcel of any New Testament textual analysis in future. However, orality not only revealed the importance of performance criticism to New Testament studies, it also has significant ramifications for Bible translation. This literary bias of uh, New Testament st studies um, was passed on without question to, to Bible translation. And even in my own experiences of translation in Africa, that it never occurred to me or my instructors that we should think about uh, what we were translating as having uh, the purpose of a different medium. Um, we, I remember studying Greek, never hearing the Greek. And then when I began to think in terms of, of performance of hearing and, and uh, uh, managing how gestures and uh, interactions with the audience would work for a composition, it changed completely what I had to look for in terms of translation. Um, the challenge is it's not, it's, it's not as simple as taking uh, oral features of Greek, in this case, and putting them into uh, some uh, other language but you have to find the functionality of how those oral features in Greek were being used. And then an investigation uh, of the host language determine what would be the functional equivalent of these uh, structures, of these repetitions. Is repetition the way to do the same thing as it, as it might function in Greek? So it, it brought along a whole new set of questions for me and for the indigenous translators as we were working in Africa. One of the most important things that happens when we read a translation of the New Testament is, un unbeknownst to us, we're reading a translation that is written in order to be read either privately or to be read aloud in public to a church episode by episode. 
there are no translations for performance. If we had translations for performance, we would be um, highlighting different features of the text. Uh, so we need translations that reflect the orality of the text. Uh, and the translation that I've done for the book Marcus Story, for example, captures what we call verbal threads. There's been a tendency among translators to uh, translate the same word different ways in every episode. But to hear it in Greek, you hear the same word repeated. And so it recalls previous episodes and provides a thread through the story, a motif, that, uh, that hearers can follow because it's, it's an echo. It's not a literary motif. It's an, it's an echo because it's an oral thing. In fact, there are many clues in the New Testament texts themselves regarding performance. These clues have escaped scholars because they were not aware of the extent of orality in the texts they've been dealing with. In fact, I'm convinced that uh, the Gospel of Mark, for example, has most of the stage directions right there in the story. When somebody screams, or somebody moves or enters into somewhere, or somebody um, lifts their eyes or their hands, touches somebody. These are all stage directions for the person telling the story to, to make the story as meaningful as possible. And it happened. Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. And as he was coming up from the waters, immediately he saw the heavens being ripped apart and the spirit, like a dove, coming down onto him. And there was a voice from the heavens. You are my only son. I delight in choosing you. Immediately, the Spirit drove him out to the desert. He was in the desert 40 days, tested by Satan, and he was with the wild animals. And the angels were serving him. Well, uh, why is oral studies important for Bible translators? I, because I suspect Bible translators have often had a, an inferiority complex uh, to the extent that if you are translating from the original and you know that uh, translation means interpretation, then what you're going to produce is going to be defective and not as good as the original. Uh, now, if you take the point about oral tradition as uh, material which is the same material but it can be told and used differently and, and different expression, different emphasis and so on, then you realise this character of living tradition. Uh, that it, 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 it adapts, uh, it responds, it speaks afresh and so on. And then translation simply becomes part of that ongoing living tradition process. Uh, by appreciating the character of the gospel material, again particularly, as originally oral tradition, you, you get the sense of a living tradition which begins by being living tradition. It's not, it's not something fixed and then becomes adaptable. It's always been adaptable, living, flexible. New Testament scholars have always been prepared to turn to other disciplines for tools to analyze the Bible and the world of the Bible. The growing realization that the Bible is an oral artifact is currently forcing Bible scholars to other and so far unexplored interdisciplinary methodologies. This was one of the results of the three-year-long research seminar of Studorium Novi Testamenti Societas, or SNTS, into orality and the New Testament. One thing that we discovered through the SNTS initiative was the, uh, I think, tremendous advantage of allowing the, the disciplines that exist to converge in one conversation. Uh, 
again, we had, we had biblical study specialists, we had Bible translation specialists, cultural anthropologists, performance critics, uh, all of them joining into one, one conversation that was helping us to, I think, again, understand the importance of, of orality, the importance of storytelling, and, and how contemporary these things are. These are not ancient um, practices, and these are not practices which are limited to certain parts of the world, uh, but they are uh, found throughout the world and still very much a part of our time, and give us a kind of connectedness back to the time in which the ancient texts emerged. Um, continuing with that idea of conversation and convergence of discipline, the uh, NIDA Institute for Biblical Scholarship and Translation Studies, based at the American Bible Society, uh, is able uh, to carry out on an annual basis a, a two-week workshop in Italy in which it is our goal to, to in some ways continue this conversation which will help us to further uh, explore and understand areas such as orality and the implications for Bible translation, the implications for biblical studies, and the implications for performance criticism. Uh, our task is really again to, to make the scriptures available in, in ways that are most effective and in the media that are most appropriate to that particular uh, community. This NIDA school that I've mentioned, which meets once a year, is in some ways very much um, a continuation of that SNTS uh, seminar. And the ramifications of orality and performance criticism are already beginning to bring changes in Bible translation. One of the things that I realized early on in my studies of oral performance criticism with biblical translation is uh, I was oftentimes in the context of Africa filtering the biblical text through a North American or European mindset. And one of the things I'm hoping to do is to allow a more direct relationship between uh, a biblical view of oral performance and, uh, in, in the case with me, of African performance. And so really to learn from African performers about how to go about uh, the composition and translation of these biblical texts. The reality is that uh, even if you're not thinking about oral performance uh, with the biblical text, um, quite often it's publicly read. Um, but the reader may have no hints as to, as to what to emphasize or, or how to go about this, this presentation. So it seemed important to be more intentional about doing historical research into what was being highlighted in the, in the biblical composition and then in a, taking advantage of some uh, sociolinguistic uh, studies of ethnopoetics to uh, begin to present for performers um, hints as to how to go about reading or how to go about performing publicly these, these biblical texts. It's my conviction that each generation uh, must retell the biblical story for its own generations. For that to happen, we need new translations. Um, we'll always be working from the the basic biblical languages, but in the way the ways in which those languages are delivered, the ways in which the biblical story uh, can be delivered for each of the traditions, um, will require uh, ongoing translation work. I think through the kind of study that we have been doing through SNTS, through the NIDA school in Misano, Italy, what we are discovering is that translation, if you like, can leap away from the page and take new life in different kinds of media. The study of orality and the increasing realization that the New Testament has an oral performance dimension to it are set to turn New Testament studies on its head. And it is not an add-on. It implies a fundamental change in conceptualizing what New Testament studies are. Orality studies are crucial for New Testament work. We have been reading the New Testament as texts there's a whole different way you read them, study them, and evaluate them as scholars in a print medium than you would thinking in terms of morality and performance. 
This is performance literature. The New Testament collection is every bit as performance literature as drama would be or a musical score would be. But can you imagine musicologists sitting in a library and doing nothing but reading scores and never hearing a performance? But sadly, it seems that this is exactly what New Testament scholars have been doing all along. They develop methodologies and constructed hypotheses based on flawed assumptions. Orality now demands that the paradigm should be re-examined. Now that first of all means that we need to understand oral cultures quite well. And we are beginning to do that. There are a number of scholars who are working on the oral culture of the first century. It is not an add-on. It is what the whole culture is about. It's one of those studies that changes the way you think about everything. It just doesn't add information on. We need to think of the whole performance event and reconstruct some performance scenarios and then imagine what these texts might have meant and how they might have been received, what's, what's our potential for a range of interpretations within a context like that. And that is going to be a challenge to New Testament scholarship because we are going to have to think about ways to look at these texts differently from the ways we've looked at in the past. We need different skills. And this is nothing short of a massive paradigm shift that needs to happen in New Testament studies. A lot of what New Testament scholars have been doing and have been working on is now proving to be irrelevant or based on faulty presuppositions of what the New Testament was and is. This, of course, is a bold statement. And if it is true, it would mean reinventing New Testament studies from a totally different perspective. Is this possible? Perhaps, perhaps not. But one thing is certain. With a full understanding of the oral dimensions of the New Testament, it can never be business as usual for New Testament scholars.